to today's Ask the Expert. I'm very excited. I mean, I'm excited about all of the Ask the Expert, but especially excited today to have Charles Tinsley with us. Um, before I introduce Charles, I wanted to just remind everybody about some of the technical things. So if you're watching this, hello. Um, if you have a technical issue, you can't hear us, you can't see us for some reason, you just want to make a general comment about Friday or the weekend or whatever it is, put that in chat. We have our amazing marketing manager, Wendy, monitoring chat. If you have questions for Charles as he's going through his presentation or just in general, put that in the Q&A box and he'll make sure that he answers all of the questions when he's done presenting. Or if you have just questions about estate planning, then I can answer those as well. Um, let's see. And we are going to record today's webinar. So if you want to watch it again, you want to share it with a friend or a family member that you know is going to benefit from today's webinar, it will be available probably early next week on our YouTube channel. And check out some of our other YouTube videos if you haven't already. Okay, so today's Ask the Expert is all about your stuff, your parents' stuff, your family stuff, all of the stuff that's there, right, and how we can get rid of it, right, in a, in a nice way. So Charles is here to talk to us. Charles is a 17-year veteran of the collectibles industry. He's owned and operated successful jewelry and fine uh, asset buying businesses and offices. He is hailing from Texas. Don't judge him too harshly out here in California. Um, as well as owning and operating a licensed auction house. In recent years, Charles developed a unique service to help clients sell their treasures, right? We want to sell them, not just give them away because we probably did. We probably know our kids don't want them, right? Um, he's accumulated knowledge, contacts, resources that together ensure clients receive top dollar for selling all of their stuff. The demand for the service is so great, he's actually expanded and the Keys Guild was founded so Charles could share his knowledge and resources with professionals throughout the country, which is why he's here today, helping us share all of this with you. And the goal for him is to create a mastermind network of collectible advisors large enough to help anyone anywhere. So we are so fortunate to have you speaking with us today, Charles. I'm going to turn it over to Charles. He has a short presentation, It'll probably take a half an hour or so. And again, as he's going through this, make sure that you get your questions in so that he has a chance to answer them. Take it away. All right. Well, let me get this started. All right. I hope that is showing up for everyone to see. It, it's showing up for me. And that's, I guess, all that matters really in the long run. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, Maggie, uh, Wendy, thank you all so much for uh, allowing me to do this. It's always an honor to, to get a chance to speak to folks and uh, uh, share my, my knowledge. Um, this is particularly fun for me because your audience is my favorite audience. That's who I work with. In, uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth market in Texas, most of my speaking these days is done to uh, people in the industry where I'm teaching them how to work with these folks, but getting to, to address uh, them now, uh, the, the people kind of here on the front line, this is my favorite thing. These are the people I enjoy working with the most. We're going to talk about how uh, less stuff might make sense uh, for most of us and uh, this is a big topic. There's a lot to it. I can uh, I could go on quite a while, but I've just, what I'm doing here today is I want to hit some of the interesting spots that I think might at least get you thinking uh, and um, and uh, help you make some decisions about what you might do with your stuff. Um, the I won't go into uh, Maggie did such a great job of introducing me. I won't go into much of these qualifications or details. I think the most important thing is the part that she talked about here at the bottom uh, where I found in the Keys Guild. Uh, so we're dedicated to developing and advancing collectibles advising as a new industry specialty. It's just it's very important for people to have help in this crazy collectibles market. Um, so I want to first talk about what a collectibles advisor is because I, one of these days, if you... Uh, uh, are going to get rid of some of your items, or if you're a family member that's going to be responsible for getting rid of some items for, for the family, uh, it would be nice if you had someone like a collectibles advisor. And I think it's really important to uh, tell you that when I say collectibles, it's not really what a lot of people think of, because most people think of that expensive painting or wine collection, coins, you know, these really higher value type things. But in my world, when I say collectibles, it could be 
some in, little souvenir that you picked up along the way, uh, uh, no value item. So I'm talking about things that are the least and the greatest, all the things, because at some point someone has to deal with all of the things. So we need to help with that. So a collectibles advisor is a uh, client advocate. Number one, foremost, uh, they are there to try to help the client accomplish whatever their goal is. So we have to figure out what you uh, are trying to do, uh, what you need to get rid of, and then educate you on the market, and then use all the resources we can to help you accomplish that better than you might would have been able to on your own. Another unique thing about a collectibles advisor is that we're unencumbered by any relationships in the industry. There's a ton of great knowledge in the collectibles world. If you ever watch Antiques Roadshow, those people are my favorite. I work with a number of them. Uh, I'm fascinated. Uh, I kind of idolized a few of them. And they have so much wonderful knowledge, but most of the knowledge in the collectibles world is owned, possessed by individuals that have one solution. It may be the, uh, the um, Asian pottery expert at Sotheby's. Well, his only solution is Sotheby's, or it may be uh, an antique toy dealer, and his only solution is his, his business, his dealership. So the problem with our industry is that all the, the knowledge is possessed by people that can't really offer anything but their own solution. A collectibles advisor, on the other hand, has access to all of the solutions. The world is our oyster when it comes to trying to pick out the best way to help our clients. And the other benefit of a collectibles advisor is because there's so many of us, uh, the industry uh, wants to take care of us. They want access to your treasures which they assume we may find. So working with a collectibles advisor can just bring a lot of special treatment to our clients. I want to give you kind of a practical application of the, how this works. So, so as a collectibles advisor, I had a client in Dallas in my market that had um, this piece of art. They had this piece and actually six others. And um, this appeared to be and was supposed to be done by Theodore Geisel, uh, Dr. Zeus. Um, my client had already had some experts in working with them before I was brought in. One of them was an actual, actually an antique roadshow uh, expert uh, from Heritage Auctions, which is a large auction house in Texas. Well, they saw this uh, collection of art and they passed on it. They chose not to work with it because they just weren't convinced it was authentic. And they went on to a few things that they thought were easier. Uh, and uh, uh, so this was just sitting there. Um, I was convinced it was real, and I pressured Heritage to do deeper work, uh, and eventually we did get them to take on the collection. They were able to confirm it was real. We sold it in California through their Los Angeles auction, and the collection sold for over $100,000. Well, it wasn't that I knew more about Dr. Zeus or Theodore Geisel's work than they did, it was just that I knew more about my client than they did. As a collectibles advisor, I had spent more time with my client. Uh, I had more information. I had heard more stories. Uh, the big auctions, the big dealers are always looking for the really big things. And they, they can sometimes go so fast, just hitting the high spot that they miss some of the treasures. Well, I had learned from my client that uh, she was elderly and her father and uh, his wife, Maria, uh, lived in La Jolla, California, next door to Theodore Geisel. As a matter of fact, there was a, 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 a gazebo at the back of their property up on a hill, and they would spend time together drinking wine and, and just enjoying spending that time together. And uh, most of this work actually was related to that friendship that they had. This piece right here is the only known self-portrait that Theodore Geisel ever did, ever did. And he did it, of course, in his anamorphic style. Uh, so that was kind of fun. On the back of this piece, it says, it talks about apparently Maria had been ill for a while and he was letting her know that they were looking forward to spending time again with him at the gazebo and he was patiently waiting for her to get well. So, so there was no doubt that this stuff was authentic. So I didn't have to be an expert. I just had to listen to my client and then pursue advocating for them to get this into the market and that's how it worked out. That's, that's how uh, collectibles advising works. Um, so we're talking today about stuff, okay? Uh, some stuff can be a, a real joy to us. 
Uh, some stuff can be a real burden to us, um, probably more than we realize. A lot of people figure out when they get rid of things that for some reason they just feel a little lighter, feel a little bit better. So, so the stuff can be good. It can be bad for us. I spend a lot of try time trying to get my clients and teaching the, my co uh, collectibles, advising students how to get their clients to think a little differently about the stuff that we have, that we have in our life. Um, it's interesting to know that most of the things we have will outlast us. Um, we don't really own anything, if you think about it. When we buy something, we we really bought the opportunity to take ownership of it for a while, to possess it, to care for it, to hopefully enjoy it. Uh, we never knowingly or uh, you know consciously commit to to wanting it forever, loving it forever, or, or needing it forever. And we certainly don't commit to finding the best home for it when we're through. Uh, and we don't commit to getting the top dollar for it when we sell. That's just not part of the relationship. I think some of us approach a lot of the items that we have as though we, we got it, it was till death do we part. It's almost like a marriage between us and the things in our life. And it, it just doesn't have to be that way. So one of the biggest questions people have whenever they start considering getting rid of their stuff is, well, I, what's it worth? I don't even know how to decide if it has much value or not. Generally speaking, uh, anything that you have today is not worth nearly as much as it used to be. Uh, there's too much material in the market. Um, the younger generation has no interest in their stuff. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, but there's just been a complete change in sentiment towards stuff and it's not just a, a cycle uh, that may come back around sadly but this complete change in the way people approach or view stuff appears to be fairly permanent it's going to be a uh, a uh, it's going to affect the market moving forward so so it's uh, important for us to recognize that as more and more material hits the market we have less people buying it it's going to be harder to get much for the things we have but sadly, um, or not necessarily sadly, but it's our human nature, however, we generally feel like our stuff's worth more than we can get for it out of the market. And that creates a dilemma for us. It makes it a bit emotional at times, uh, and it makes it tough for us. I like to go through a little mental exercise when I talk to people. I want you to, for a minute, imagine that each of you use your own home for this exercise. And I want you to imagine that you're in your home and you're in the largest room. You're sitting in the middle of the largest room of your home. Your home is barren of stuff. There's nothing there. there there's nothing on the floor or the walls and the cabinets and the shelves. It is simply void of anything except for you sitting in the main room. You're sitting on a simple chair and in front of you is, let's say, a TV tray. And on that TV tray, you have a laptop and beside the laptop is a stack of money. Your laptop's on a website called mystuff.com and um, it's a great website. So each of you will have a unique experience on mystuff.com because mystuff.com has on it available for you to buy every single thing that was in your house. It's laid out nicely. It's in all the different departments it would take, whether it's the you know, fashion department or the kitchen, uh, whatever you have, there's a department for it and everything is listed with great pictures and great descriptions and everything is listed very, very cheap uh, because the price that it's listed is what you would have gotten for or would get for it if you sold it. Now, I want you to think and understand that that stack of money beside your computer is the exact amount of cash it would take for you to buy back everything that's on this site, to get everything that was in your house back in your house. So as you go through and look at every single thing that you had, and then you look at the price, which is super cheap, I want you to think about whether you would rather have the cash equivalent to it or the thing. A lot of people might stop at this point and look around at this big empty house and think, you know what? I don't want this stuff, and I don't think I need a house that this is this big anymore. You may be going through there, and you come across that framed sign print that you had on the wall, and you're, you're thinking, well, you know, I paid $750 for that, and wow, I can buy it right now for $100. And you'd be surprised how many, how many people 
would not pay the hundred dollars, they'd keep the hundred dollars rather than taking that piece back. So this is just a really interesting way to rethink how we view our own stuff. And it helps us to think about the fact that if we wouldn't buy back our own stuff, well, why would anyone else pay much more for it than that? That, that is the challenge. And that helps us to, to begin to find a place to understand the real value for these things. Now, I guess it's important to ask or to consider, do uh, any of you have too much stuff? Uh, I can't see you, but uh, if the science is right, most of you should be raising your hands. Most of you probably do have too much stuff. There was a fascinating study that was done at UCLA, and it was designed to try to figure out how much of the available space that people have in their homes do they use on a regular basis? And they did this by following the, the people in the homes uh, over a period of time. Uh, and they were designed to, to develop this based on the actual foot traffic in all the different areas in the uh, home. This is an example of one of the results. So, so this layout of this home, this was one of the participants and this was the result. And each red dot is not one step, but it, it represents a number of steps that may have happened in that area. And once it reached enough contacts in that particular uh, point uh, of the layout, it would generate a red dot. That top center portion is the kitchen. And so you can see there's a ton of activity around the dinner table and in the food preparation area. And then in the top right, that's a TV room. It's a family room. There's a little outline of a TV up there. And you can see there's a lot of traffic there. There's quite a bit of traffic down that, that lower right-hand side of the bathroom, but really not a whole lot of traffic anywhere else in the house. And this, this result is pretty consistent with what they found in this study. They said that the two, number one and number two most active uh, areas in a home were number one, the eating area and the food prep area, those two together was, was number one always. The second most active area in most homes was the TV room where people would hang out. And so this is a great reflection of that. And that would have been true for me. It is true for me today. My grid would look quite a bit like this. Another interesting fact that they found out was that for the homes that had garages, only 25% of the garages were used to store cars. 75% uh, of the garages were filled with stuff and there was a lot of stuff. So this, US, this UCLA study, the results were that the average family uses approximately 40% of their home, which means that the average family home is 60% climate controlled storage. Well, so that's kind of interesting, right? That's, a, that's, that's kind of a kind of a waste actually. And it, it causes you to think, well, why do, why do we do that? Um, and so, and by the way, what does that mean to us? Well, the results were that the average family has too much stuff. And quite often it's the stuff that's in the spaces that's blocking their ability to use it. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, most people don't do formal dining anymore. And yet most homes have a formal dining room, dining room table, chairs, china huts, china, crystal, all the things that go along with that. But if you're not formal dining or doing formal dining, uh, there's not much else you can do in that room. That stuff is preventing the use of that space in any other way. I, I, I did something like this at my home before I downsized. I had a room that I was converting to a gym so I could get buff and uh, look much better than I, than I do now. Um, filled it up with all the best equipment, uh, used it for about a month, and uh, then stopped using it. And then eventually closed the door. I was feeling guilty every time I looked inside. And it's clear that the stuff that I had in that room was completely blocking my ability to use that space because I wasn't going to work out and there was nothing else I could do there. There's a lot of examples of that. People may have an office. They convert a room to an office, but they sit on the couch or at the table with their laptop doing their work. Can't do anything else with that room. It's filled with office stuff. So the idea here is when we, this, and the reason this is so applicable is because if we look at our own homes and we look at the rooms we don't use much and look at the stuff that's there, we might make a decision that, you know, it is that stuff that's keeping me from using this room. If I did something else with that, I might get better use of it. So why not consider possibly getting rid of it? And that is 
the, the, the meaning or the lesson learned from this study. Some of you might go, listen, I understand what you're saying, Charles, but um, I'm keeping this stuff because I'm going to give it to my kids, all right? Which means they haven't got the memo. The kids haven't broke the news to them yet. Uh, the kids and great, the, uh, and great kids out here, they don't have much interest in our stuff anymore. Uh, that's a, this is a reality. And it's not, it's not new news. It's old news. Uh, the millennials, they're turning 43 now. I used to, whenever I would speak to um, uh, active seniors about this whole downsizing thing, you know, I'd ask them a long time ago, have you heard your kids may not be interested in your stuff? And a few arms would go up, but most of them were pretty, um, my kids are going to want my stuff. But in my most recent times of presenting, and when I would ask that question, they'd all throw up their arms. There was lots of commentary, lots of fun and giggling. Everybody knows it. They've got it. These younger folks just don't seem to want uh, stuff that was part of someone else's journey. As a result, we've lost our biggest buying market, and that's that next generation. So the market's filled with material, and we don't have enough buyers, and there's all types of ways to put our material out in the market, and we just can't get it sold. Um, I think it's fascinating. I can't spend much time on it here, but I think it's fascinating when you realize we have a generation that came along that symbiotically all seem to feel the exact same way about this topic. I mean, it's national. There's more than national. I was doing a podcast a while back uh, in the UK, and I asked them at that time, is that the same with you? I mean, are, are the young people there resisting and showing no interest in their stuff? They said, absolutely. They have the exact same thing there. So now we're talking about an international reality that you have a generation that just put a halt to this whole taking and passing down of stuff, which is fascinating. They didn't get together and plan it. Uh, there was no organization behind it. So you have to wonder, how did they do it? How did this happen? And I think uh, if we thought more about it, we'd probably realize the one thing they all have in common is their parents' generation, the boomers. I'm a boomer. I'm a, I'm a parent of millennials. I think... I don't know why, I don't know exactly how yet. I'm gonna keep thinking about it. I think it must be the parents of the millennials. Now in their defense, I'll tell you something interesting. I've talked with a lot of them. Uh, I, I do think that they are not heartless. A lot of people say, well, they don't care about anything. I don't think that's true, they care. They just are more interested in making memories, uh, experiences than they are in collecting stuff. So collecting memories and experiences, not collecting stuff. A millennial, would tell you, you know, I love that blue bonnet painting that hangs in grandmother's house on the wall right above her couch. And I particularly love the fact that that painting's hanging on her wall above her couch, but I get the most joy out of that painting when I'm experiencing it there in her home with her. They'd say without grandmother in the picture, without her being there with the painting, I don't need that painting. They would say every time I see a painting, of blue bonnets, I think of her. Matter of fact, every time I see blue bonnets, I think of her. And that's different because my generation would say, I can't get rid of the blue bonnet painting. It reminds me of grandmother. So in a way they free themselves from locking all that emotion and that, those memories into one thing. And it opens up their ability to feel that way about a lot more things and experience that memory of her in a different way. So this millennial effect is one of the biggest things that's affecting uh, the value of items. Uh, so we can't ignore it. I'm spending more time on it uh, uh, because it's so important. Uh, they continue to, dump, to influence the market. They're starting to turn 43. Uh, it's interesting as they turn 43 now that most of them are making more money. And that means that they have extra money where they can collect as well. And so now we finally have something in common. And it's really interesting when you understand that most generations when they get to this age uh, and they're making more income, will begin to surround themselves with some of the stuff that they like to collect. And most people groups tend to collect things from their past, quite often things from their youth. Uh, this is reflected right here. So, you know, in my lifetime, I would have um, had uh, baseball trading cards. Uh, if I had enough money, I might be interested in collecting muscle cars or the things from my youth. But but the millennials, they had Pokemon cards and they had video games. So here's an example of a Pokemon card that sold in 2021 for $360,000. And next to it is a Super Mario game, not the cog cell or the machine, just the game sold for $1.5 million. There's no explaining that. But it does reflect the fact that these things that were part of the millennials' youth 
are suddenly becoming more valuable. So as you look at your stuff, if you still have some of those things hanging around that may have belonged to your millennial children, you might want to look at them a little more seriously just to make sure we don't miss some kind of a surprise like this. I like to, when we're talking about this, talk about a few uh, common categories that sometimes have misunderstood values. And if we understood the value better, it might affect whether we decided to keep it or get rid of it. Um, antique furniture is one of the worst things. And when I say antique furniture, I mean the dark wood, large, ornate type of furniture, that stuff that really looks antique -y. Well, it's just the hardest stuff for us to get rid of uh, in the collectibles market. There's so much of that material and there's so few people that are taking it in. Uh, and a lot of, because homes are selling so fast these days, a lot of people don't have time to get them in the market and get them sold right. So a lot of it ends up for free and it just continues to devastate the value. So antique dark wood looking furniture, very, very tough. Formal dining, we already talked about it. Everything related to formal dining, the values are greatly diminished. Except for silver, silver flatware, and I'm talking sterling silver, not plated, but sterling flatware and serviceware and tea sets and so on. Well, most people aren't using it. They're committed to never cleaning it again. And because silver is at a healthy value right now, it can be kind of appealing to sell that stuff. And that's the same for jewelry. You know, most of us have some gold jewelry sitting around, for instance, it may be a high school ring, a gold tooth, a broken chain, uh, stuff that's just out of style that we're not wearing anymore. Maybe something that was gifted to us that's just the style that you could never wear. And when people see how fast that adds up value-wise because of the commodity value and gold being so high, that can be a very appealing thing for a lot of people to sell as well. As well. Same thing with old watches. Most people never throw away an old watch. It just doesn't seem right. Uh, and so as a result, when we're working with our clients, you'd be surprised how often we might find an old watch that for one reason or another has become collectible because of the style or the mechanism. Uh, so that can be a positive thing. Mid-century modern, I know in California and in that area, it's been strong for a very long time. It's a strong commodity nationwide. It's, it has been strong a long time. It doesn't seem to be dying out. So anything mid-century modern, whether it's fashion or, or furniture or art, it could be kitchen utensils. If it's mid-century modern, it's doing pretty good. So it can be an appealing thing to sell. Vintage stereo systems, vinyl records, having a bit of a renaissance. So not all these systems have a lot of value. But there is much more interest today than there was, say, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago. And so that's a fun thing to, for people to sell. And we already talked about Pokemon cards and video game systems. Most of them don't have a lot of value, but there's some treasures out there. And so we have to just give a little more attention to those. And then coins, you know, the, that's one of the collectibles that's kind of a dying collectible. The younger generation doesn't collect coins. And a lot of families have them. And so when they get ready to sell those, they can have a lot of silver value and they can have some numismatic or collectible value. So I would say for most families, coins, silver, sterling silver, and jewelry and old watches are very common and some of the more pleasant experiences for people to have when they want to get rid of stuff. However, the most important treasure for most of us is our home. Uh, the market is, is, has been good, uh, it's had some ups and downs, but the market for homes generally in this country is very strong. And it can be said for most people that the value of our homes is up more than our contents are down. So for a lot of people that will consider downsizing at some point, um, if you started out from this baseline of if you sold your home in today's market and gave away everything in the house, you're probably still going to be ahead of the game. So if you get anything for the stuff that's in the house, then it's just icing on the cake. Well, that's a very healthy way to approach downsizing. Now, um, you never know what I'm going to run into when I'm in people's homes. So I thought it was kind of fun to share a few of these with you. Had a client that had a shrunken head. Don't know why they had a shrunken head. Uh, it was ghastly, uh, and I was actually thought that they were playing a joke on me when they brought it in, but it was actually a true shrunken head, and um, it's interesting. It represents something interesting for me in this industry, and that is when you come across something so, so different like this, that means that I probably don't have a, a, a connection or a resource. It gives me the opportunity to develop relationships and to learn more about a completely different part of the collectibles industry. 
most auction houses will not sell human body parts. They, <laughs> it's probably a good thing. However, there is an industry out there uh, and it is the oddities industry for collectibles, which is just fascinating and the people are fascinating. We actually sold this piece to a collector in California, sold it for $7,000. Sounded good to me. I don't know if it's a great price or not, but what a fun experience and what an unusual thing to work with. Uh, many years ago, I had a client that I had bought some jewelry from her and she was super sweet. We had a great connection. She called me up and said, hey, I'm going to have a garage sale. I've got a lot of costume jewelry. Would you help me separate it so that I can uh, uh, sell it and do the best I can? I said, sure, bring it in. She brought in so much costume jewelry. I had no idea she was talking about this much, but it was a lot of fun. And we decided, hey, for, for getting it done in an easy manner, let's put two piles. We'll have a pile for the five dollars and under and a pile for the five dollars and over and I came across this brooch and um, it really looked like a costume brooch with the white rhinestones and the red rhinestones and just the overall look to it um, it I felt I was about to put it in the over five dollar pile but I thought you know this thing just feels like a better piece so I got my loop out and when I inspected it closer I realized the white rhinestones were old mine cut diamonds and the red rhinestones were old cut rubies and so I tested the metal and it was platinum uh, it would turn out to be a, a late 1800s Edwardian style uh, ladies brooch with diamonds and rubies and so uh, I got the opportunity to broker that for we sold it for over three thousand dollars which was good back then it would be worth more today but it completely changed the way I look at costume jewelry and I have found a lot of wonderful treasures mixed in with the stuff that most people think is junk uh, or costume jewelry this little group of paintings, which is a triptych, three pieces that make one, uh, came in to me. I tried to figure out who the artist was. We couldn't make out the signature on it. Uh, looked like it was just going to be a nice modernist or abstract type uh, art set being sold for its aesthetic, uh, aesthetic value uh, on the market as decorator type art. Uh, I put it into an auction that had national exposure. It wasn't an auction that gets high value, but they moved this kind of material. It was a seven-day auction. Um, and it was online on the seventh morning, on the seventh day or the morning of the seventh day, uh, I noticed that this piece had bidding up to $3,000, a little over $3,000. I looked closer and I realized we I got an artist name suddenly attributed to it. And when I researched the artist, we realized it was a very important Chinese artist and his works sell between 30 to $50,000. That's a nightmare because we had not attributed that name until the last day. We didn't know it was that artist. We have it in an auction house that shouldn't have that quality of art. And uh, my savvy client would figure this out. And this, this was going to be a disaster. So I was fighting with the auction house and the auction owner, trying to get them to pull this. We were going through this throughout the day. But fortunately, by mid-afternoon, the bidding had exceeded $30,000. And uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the auction, it sold for over $40,000. So now I look like a hero and I was so lucky uh, a, a, one of the uh, people who saw the auction wasn't interested in the piece, but knew who, what it was, gave that information to the auction house. They were able to apply it to the listing. It changed everything. And it shows us that sometimes the market knows more than the experts. And most often the market will di dictate the value for the things that are available. So, so those are just things that I hope will get you thinking more about your stuff, maybe looking at it a little bit differently. So in closing, you know, I hope that you will consider getting rid of the stuff that no longer has a place in your life or has meaning. Uh, keep your memories. Those will always be yours. And I think that most of you will find that it does make good sense to get rid of these things now rather than waiting till later and passing that on to someone else. So that's my story. I, I hope that that, uh, uh, has helped you. Uh, does does anyone have any questions? Um, not to feel overly judged, but a lot of that hit home <laughs> with me. <laughs> we don't use our garage for our cars. I also have a separate storage unit. When my grandparents passed away, and you guys can see the antique secretary desk that I brought to the office, nobody wanted it. And I couldn't not take it. And so I have a storage unit that has other antiques and dishes and things that they had antiques that I just, and so I was hoping you could talk about sort of the emotional attachment to the stuff. I think I'm kind of unique in that sense that I'm the next generation that's got this emotional attachment to their, their stuff. But um, 
I think that's one of the barriers that a lot of people have about getting rid of their stuff is they have this real emotional attachment to it. Do you find that that's the case? So not as much as it used to be. I mean, people really, well, think about it. Just one generation before, if the stuff would be the end to relationships for families fighting over these things. So, so this is a much different look. Um, I do encounter people within families. Usually it's the executor that uh, feels this tremendous responsibility uh, to, do, to not uh, squander something. They knew that it meant a lot to the family member. And quite often that emotional connection is more to the experience of the family member with the thing than it really is the thing. The, the truth is these things become what we kind of call gifts of burden because you've received it with this tremendous burden based on love uh, um, to, to do right by the peace. And so if you or any family member that's listening understands you can't change the market, you, you can't change the value and you certainly can't do anything about the fact that there's thousands of those pieces behind you out in the market right now with no buyers. So, um, so that's, that, that is just the reality of it. And so, you know, hopefully knowing that helps us realize uh, what can we do about this? And, and why would you pay to store stuff that the value is going to continue to decline over time? And I will tell you this, I, I believe this with all my heart and talking with so many of my elderly clients, I don't think our family members looking down on us would want us to um, be burdened with these things. They would not want us to be emotional, to be upset or to, to uh, go through anything other than, you know, joy uh, because these things don't mean anything to them anymore. And they certainly wouldn't want them to be a burden to, to you. So you hear that everyone, it's a gift of burden. This is, <laughs> it's a common question I get in estate planning, Maggie, what do I do with all of my stuff? And I give them this huge speech about how they should be giving it away while they're living because then they can give the story with it. But really, I didn't even think that it might be a burden to them more than anything. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of questions, so I'm going to ask them for you. Can you talk a little bit about books? Is it different experiencing selling maybe a large collection with a specific theme versus like single volume type books? Right now, I'm in the middle of this question. I have a client that's in uh, Virginia that has over 4,000 books. Uh, most of them are dealing with military uh, and a lot of them are dealing with civil war. And this gentleman has paid well over a quarter million dollars for the books that he curated over his lifetime. And I've seen the individual, probably paid a fortune for these things. So it's a nightmare scenario because um, he doesn't, they're not organized. He's too old to work with them any longer. They're in storage. They take up a tremendous amount of space and someone would have to go in and work with each individual book to identify its value. And it's just a cost. There's no way that he can afford to have someone do that. The other problem is that because so much of the information that we're in these books is digital online now, anyone who really wants the information would probably not get it from a book. They would get it online. And so the value for collectible books has, has declined greatly. He still has some wonderful treasures. We know we've seen his, what he bought. So we know mixed in there somewhere are some wonderful treasures. But the other problem is when you put that much of the same thing into the market, you flood the market and you simply kill your own market by putting too much material at one time. And people will hold back their money from certain items to go for that one special item. And so it can really kill the deal. Oh, so. who would have thought so specific? Yes. Um, uh, Charles, do you help people in other states, maybe starting with Zoom? Yeah, I do that quite often. It's a... Uh, 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 the that painting I was telling you about that sold so well, I did a Zoom with the the son and his wife while they were there and told them which items to you know to grab, and then I helped them get rid of that. So working remotely, uh, I, I've had some success with that, and I love trying to help clients when I can uh, by doing that. I hope so, you may have a client, for instance, at some point if they needed help, one of my keys members, we call them keys, might be in that market that could help them, and I would help through the key. So. So there's ways for me to do that. And I'm always glad to do that. Awesome. Good to know. See, Charles is available or we'll refer you out. Someone who yeah. can help you. Yeah. Um, you heard, you were talking about that website, mystuff.com or whatever, the yeah. fictional website. But is there a website that exists where you can buy things like you have in your home or, or kind of see how inexpensive they are? <laughs> like judge your stuff. 
Yeah, you know, uh, there there are a couple of things. Um, I'm hoping to do a fun event at some point for for folks like that are watching right now uh, called Mind Your Own Business. And yeah. in that, what I want them to do is I want them to basically mine through their stuff and educate them on how to find that value. Uh, they can do a lot of the work for me and that when they find that special thing, I can help them get it sold. Uh, and that there's two ways that I would encourage people to look up values for their stuff. I'm going to do this real quick. eBay, and as an appraiser, uh, we used to poo-poo eBay and the results for that. But if you go to eBay and do a search for something, there is a, a left-hand column. And if you go down far enough on that column, you can find a completed listings button. And it will refresh and show you what things actually sold for. A little bit more to it, but eBay's completed listings is a wonderful way to find a wide range of items that our, that clients have. Most of us will go on to eBay, look up a Hummel. There's somebody has one listed for $1,000 and we're like, I've got that one. Mine's worth a thousand. When they refresh it and look at completed listings, they realize those didn't sell. The ones that sold, sold for four or $5. That's the reality of it. Now we know we go on. Um, there's another site called liveauctioneers.com. And you can search for items. And these are all results from actual auction houses, large and small, all over the country. So this is very real, very fresh data. The results for live auctioneers being auction houses means it's kind of similar to what a state sale results would be. And it does give you the ability to look up something and then hit past results. And you want to look at past results. Uh, so those are two sites if you play around with. You can begin to discover the value of a lot of your items yourself. Um, when I was going through, when I was moving and I was sorting all of grandpa's stuff into all of these various bins to then put into storage, I would Google image search, mm -hmm. you know, like the fine China or whatever, and something would pop up. And so then I get excited, like, oh, this dish is worth, you know, $300 or whatever. But now that you mentioned that that was not the completed list, that's just what somebody was hoping to get for it. Now I'm a little less excited about storing it in my storage. Well, that's, that's super important because, you know, a lot of the work that I do as a collectibles advisor isn't actually helping to sell, but helping the client to figure out which things are not going to sell, put them in an estate sale, donate them, do something with them. Because when they know the reality of it, it's disappointing, but in a way it's kind of like, you know what, what am I doing here? I'm not, I'm not going to put so much emotion and energy into this. Nobody can get anything for it. And so, so that's helpful for them, even when it's bad news, to not, to not worry about it so much or put so much effort into it. I think, I think you should add like reality check to your resume. Like really, that's kind of what it <laughs> sounds like is happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, in general, is refurbishing or restoring worth the investment in the current market, in your opinion? No. There are a few uh, cases where that, that the answer is yes, but that's, that's very rare. I mean, look, if, if you have an item that you think is valuable and you talk to me or you look up it, look it up like I was suggesting and you find out, oh, it's very valuable, actually. And the variation between the ones that were somewhat valuable and very valuable is the condition. Well, then you might consider spending some money to get yours up to the quality to get the top market. But a lot of people will um, consider refurbishing an item that even in top condition, it's still not it's like, a, like an old phonograph that is worn out or an old phonograph that you have completely refinished in great shape. Even the great shape one is still not going to sell for enough to be worth your time. So why would you do that? Uh, so I, I and, and I want to say something else you're not going to ask me, but some people will say, should I get my stuff appraised so that I won't know what the value is before I sell it? And I want you to know you do not want to do that. Appraisal values have nothing to do with market values. Uh, and it just makes makes things much, much worse for you because you have an unrealistic expectation and the documentation to prove it. And then you'll never get it sold because you'll always feel like you're going to lose money. Yeah, because you put all this time and effort into it. And now you have an yeah, emotional yeah. attachment to it. See? Yeah, that's right. You've, you've harmed yourself in that. Okay, <clears throat> I have this question too. Someone asked about 80-year-old China. I have inherited at least three sets of China from my grandmother from my great aunt and it's literally just sitting in my garage because I'm too afraid to use it and to sell it and someone says you know how do I now how do I sell it it feels like the market is flooded with china sets that you know my generation isn't using they don't want to they don't need it they've already inherited three sets like myself so now what are we supposed to do with it 
Well, uh, one thing you could use it. A lot of people are never stop and think, well, I can't get anything for it. What do I do with it? You could use it. Some very clever uh, ladies that I met recently were trading uh, uh, place settings. They, had, they would trade a one place setting of theirs with someone else. And then eventually they might have 12 different place settings. Then they would use it when they got together and have fun with it. And if they broke it, what the heck, it doesn't matter. So using it is one option. Um, gifting it is another. So here's the thing. No one's buying a full set of China. It, the, that's just not happening. The only people who are buying China is someone who has your pattern and they broke a dish and they need your cup and they need that salad plate. That's all they need. So they would buy it if you would sell your entire set piece by piece. And the only way to get any money really for your set is selling it piece by piece. And who in the world has time to do that? Um, the older the set, there is possibility it might be maybe a little bit more, probably not, uh, but the condition will become more of an issue for that stuff. Uh, and there will be um, less people interested in the pieces you have. That's so depressing because I packed them all really nicely, but maybe I need to dust them off and pull them out. <laughs> Well, that's what I hope the listeners are, are yeah. understanding is don't do that. You know, figure out what the reality is for this stuff before you, you know, you can spend money uh, trying to get this handled, which is, is sad. You could also spend a lot of time, which is even more valuable than money in some cases on this stuff and emotion. So, so go ahead and be willing to accept the fact that it may not be worth much. Uh, and, uh, and if that's what that to be the case, that'll help affect uh, how you approach what you do with these things. What about uh, sterling silver? You had mentioned that, that there's still sort of a market for that. W where would you sell that if you wanted to sell your silver? Well, so for instance, um, um, I have relationships directly with the largest refiners in the country. So when I have a client that has sterling, uh, if, if you sell gold and sterling on the streets, you go to those people who advertise, hey, we buy gold and silver and so on. They have so much of that coming in the door. Most of them offer 50, 55, 60% maybe a little more. Uh, I'd like to see our clients and your clients get closer to 80%. Mm. And so, so what we try to do is, is to figure out the easiest path to get that material directly to the actual refiner and get them top payout on it. I mean, 80% is better than 50%. I think we can all agree. Just, yes, just an attorney, is. but... Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any experience with Chinese figurines or vases, or do you know if there's a website or organization that does specialize in those items? I have certainly worked with them. I work with Lark Mason, who is an Asian specialist from the Antiques Roadshow. Um, the, um, we have to be very careful with Asian uh, uh, pottery and uh, vases and all this type of material. There's a lot of Japanese uh, and and material from that region that came back with our grandparents from the great wars. And so including all the way down to my dad's generation and they, they've served and they brought stuff back from, from that area. And so generally speaking, our Japanese um, uh, bases and porcelains are not quite as valuable, but because the Chinese market in Vietnam and that region has come up uh, from there, uh, um, as far as financially speaking, they're repatriating a lot of their items. So we've seen a rise in those in the Chinese pottery and so on. So, um, so it's kind of hard to say, where could you go to find that information? A uh, Lark Mason uh, is, is available on the website uh, or online. Uh, and people can contact me and send me stuff. And if I felt like I had a solution I could direct you to, to help you, it's very hard because we can't make out, most of us can't read the markings and the makers. So, so it, it takes a different level of expertise. Um, that was, I have a couple more questions, but you guys ask your questions while we have Charles's undivided attention. Um, what, what should you be looking for when you're picking a collectible advisor? Like Charles isn't available and you want to find somebody else to help you. What, what are the kinds of questions or what should you be looking for when you're looking for an advisor? Well, it's tough. There's not a lot right now. You know, we had, there's less than 250 collectibles advisors in the market. It's just, it, it, it's a specialty that didn't exist until we started creating it. And so that means everyone that you're going to be looking for in your market, if, if I don't have a key there for you, uh, and I may, but uh, the everyone else is going to be either an estate sale company or a, an antique dealer or an auction house person. So you will be stuck a bit with the, this knowledge resource that has one solution, and that's the service they provide. So what happens is the best way to overcome that if you don't have a collectibles advisor to help you navigate all that is to talk to as many people as you are comfortable doing that. Talk with the state sale people. Talk with multiple state sale people. 
talk with multiple um, options. The more people you talk to, you may find that, you know what, I'm going to handle these things through this person. I'm going to handle these things through this person. And I think if I'll break it up this way, uh, I may end up being better than if I just let one handle everything. So, so get as much input as you possibly can. Like, it. don't be afraid of it. Right. Oh, um, I forgot what my other question was. Sorry. I'm just going to say in general, I like mid-century modern stuff. I'm, I feel when you said that, I was like, yes, I'm that generation. We just can't yep. get enough of it. Yep. Um, okay. Well, those are all of my questions. Does anyone have any other last minute questions for Charles? Anything else that came up, Charles, you wanted to make sure everyone knows about before we sign off today? You know, I, I just think that the things we talked about uh, to get people, you know, I just think that you should not avoid the topic. I think that you should look at your stuff, think about it. Uh, don't feel bad about not liking something anymore. It may have been a special place in your life that doesn't mean it's supposed to be there your whole life. Take, take some lessons from these millennials. There's a reason why uh, we don't, uh, we, have a, we have an unhealthy relationship with stuff and it feels good to lighten our loads. And if you just, if you're not sure, get rid of something and see how you feel about it. I think you may, you may get addicted. You might be surprised. We have another question that came in. What's a realistic time frame for selling things? You know, uh, two weeks before moving is probably not enough time, but if, uh, is it something people should just be working on a mountain? They're never going to kind of summit, or is it just something that they, they have to work backwards from a deadline? What, what's your best advice? The people who start the, the earliest will, will have the best results. They're the ones who will, get get more for their items ultimately because they gave themselves times time which gave themselves options when it came to getting rid of stuff if it's a real estate situation because look i'm going to pay, capitalize on this market right now and get rid of my house you may find yourself you simply don't have that luxury of time uh, that's a very common thing today so we have entities that are designed now to come in and help get rid of your stuff quicker like max soul uh, and and other entities that specialize in uh, helping you get rid of the stuff in your house. Even if you can't have an estate sale, that you could have an online auction that they handle for you to get rid of everything. So there are some tools that will help. And if that doesn't work, you may have to donate a lot of your stuff to take, to get, you got to take advantage of your home. You can't let the stuff get in the way of your greatest treasure, which is your home. I have like all of these little, little things I'm going to go home and start saying to my parents, like these are <laughs> gifts of burden. You've just, they're drowning yourself in your stuff, you know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're not able to enjoy your house or park your garage. Um, all right, everyone. We got a, several thank yous, Charles. Uh, we really appreciate you spending your time with us today. It was a, an amazing presentation. Thank you. We Thanks. are going to be sending out an email to everyone with Charles's contact information. So if you wanted to reach out to him, you want to schedule an appointment with him and we've recorded it, like I said. So if you want to watch it again or share it, like I'm going to with my parents, share the recording with other people, you know, who are burdened by all of their stuff and start need to start uh, getting rid of it, uh, then you can do that as well. We'll have that up probably early next week. And in the meantime, everyone, happy Friday and have a great weekend. Thanks again for having me.